Good evening, everybody. My name is Sharon, and I'm the coordinator of programs at Canadian Diabetes Association, and I'll also be your host tonight. So thank you all for coming out tonight. Um, before we get started, just wanted to go through a couple of household items. Um, so on the bottom of um, the PowerPoint, you'll see a pre-survey. Um, as I already said earlier, we really want to hear from you. Um, we do read all the surveys, and if you have just a minute before we start, just click on the Survey Monkey and just take a minute, 30 seconds, to fill it up. And if you're having problems hearing me right now, uh, please dial into the teleconference, which is um, just on your screen right now. Um, it will help you to hear it a little bit better. Um, and if you do have any issues hearing, just, um, uh, just message us on the group chat, and I'll see what I can do to help you with that. Um, so just to introduce you to um, our layout tonight, uh, you'll be able to see our main PowerPoints on basically the biggest screen. On your bottom right-hand corner is where we have a group chat. Feel free to chat with people there, but I won't be monitoring anything on there. You can also private chat people by hovering over their name and then starting um, a private chat there. Now on your bottom left-hand corner is a Q&A box. Feel free to type in your questions at any time in the presentation. We'll have a um, question and answer period at the very end. Um, and so we will um, address your questions at that point. Um, so without further ado, I wanted to introduce Karen Graham, who is our speaker for tonight. Um, and she is a registered nurse and a certified diabetes educator. And she is really, really great. So I'm really excited for her to have her here. And just one more thing is that we wanted to um, acknowledge our sponsors, One Touch and, um, and Janssen. So Karen, please take it away. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you, Sharon, um, for all the work you do on these webinars and for facilitating this evening. And thank you to the BC Division of the Canadian Diabetes Association for inviting me to speak. And most of all, thank you to all of you who are on the line participating. It's actually a great pleasure for me to talk on staying upbeat with diabetes because it's a topic that's actually near and dear to my heart. And tonight, I hope to share some insights with you so when you walk away at the end of this evening, I hope you'll have at least one, if not several, things that are practical and valuable that you can use in your own life. And I certainly look forward to your questions after my presentation. And just a correction, I'm a registered dietitian and certified diabetes educator. And I'm clicking, Sharon, but nothing's happening. There, maybe it's just a little bit of a delay. So um, just a presenter disclosure. Okay, I want you to know that I'm not being sponsored by any organization to do this presentation other than the Canadian Diabetes Association. And I'm a Canadian author. I have two books, Canada's Diabetes, Meals for Good Health, and Canada's Complete Diabetes Guide, both published by Robert Rose. And I received book royalties from my publisher, and part of my royalty on my first book is paid directly to the CDA. And I also sell and distribute my books outside of bookstores. And I'm not paid to do research product or develop, uh, research or product development. And most importantly, I've been a diabetes educator and dietitian for 30 years, and I love having the chance to connect with people with diabetes. So again, thank you very much for having me here. So let's get on with the presentation. And we're going to start with a couple of questions. Um, the first question, and you're going to have an opportunity to answer this question in a moment. Sharon's going to put up a poll. Oh, she's putting it up now. And the question is to rate your stress over the past year on a scale of 1 to 5. So I want you to take a moment. Think about the past year, and if you think your stress was very low, you would um, click on the little circle that says none. If you think it was low, it would be the two, uh, sorry, very low. Low is three, medium is four, and high is five. So take a moment. I'll give you 20 seconds to make your vote. And just so you know, your votes or your, uh, uh, the way you're rating yourself is confidential. No one's going to be seeing your names. We're just going to see the totals that are coming up on the right-hand side. 
I think this is new. Sharon hasn't uh, done these before, so this is kind of a fun way to uh, kind of do a poll across the country of all of you that are on the line listening. Okay, so I'm not sure. If, I'm not sure how to tell there how many people have voted, but it looks like. Um, we don't have anybody who's had no stress, which <laughs> isn't a surprise, because probably if you had no stress, you wouldn't be on the webinar tonight. Um, just 3% um, saying very low. Uh, low is 10%, and medium is 53%, and high is 33%. And I'm just going to jot those numbers down, because we're going to come back to that a little bit later. Okay. So we'll just go to the next slide. And actually, when I'm uh, talking to my this is a question that I very often ask them to rate their level of stress, because it, it basically tells me you know, um, how, they're, how they're feeling and how much, um, whether that's something we need to address right away. The next question I'm going to have you um, answer is, do you believe stress is harmful for your health? And if you answer one, that's going to be no, not harmful. Two is going to be you know, a little bit harmful. Three is sort of medium harmful. If you go to the five, it means that you think stress is very harmful for your health. So five would be the most harmful. And if you click on one, that means you don't believe that stress is very harmful for your health. You can choose anywhere between the one and five. No, uh, one is not harmful, and five is, yes, very harmful. OK, and we're getting some percentages up there. There's 3% who think it's uh, not harmful, and, and let's see, we've got zero. And then thinking it's more harmful is 31%, and very harmful is just over 62%. OK, thank you. And we'll go to the next slide. So this is the last question. And then we're going to be coming back to these later on in the presentation. So this one is, how much time have you spent over the past year helping friends, family, neighbors, and people in your community? Over the last year, how much time have you spent helping friends, family, neighbors, and people in your community. And if you've spent very little time, you'll give yourself a 1. And if you've spent a lot of time, you would rate a 5. So 1 is not spending much time uh, with family, friends, and neighbors, and people in your community. 5 is spending a lot of time. Okay, and some of the votes are still coming out. 5 is a lot of time, and 1 is very little. And you could choose anywhere in between. So it looks like uh, some of you are rating not very much time. That's 3%. 6% for 2. 42% for 3. 29% for 4. And 19% um, have been spending a lot of time. And we're going to be coming back to this a little bit later in the presentation. OK, so we'll go on to the main part of the presentation. And so what I'm going to be talking about tonight is, first of all, we're going to look at, is stress good or bad? We're going to take a look at some of the stress hormones, some new and pretty exciting research around stress, and feelings that mean stress. And then we're going to finish off with some practical tips for you to better manage stress. And given that a large number of you identified your stress level um, as either high or very high, I'm really glad you're on the uh, call today, because I hope that you will take away um, some of these tips to, to help reduce your own level of stress. OK. So stress, we all have it. Um, it's a normal part of our life. Uh, Christmas is coming up. Can you imagine a family at Christmas without stress? Um, it, it really is part of a normal part of a normal life. Um, the question is: Is stress harmful, or is it good? And you've just answered this question. And now we're going to look at it a little bit more in terms of uh, some of the information about it.
Okay, it doesn't seem to be. Oh, and I guess there's just quite a delay there on the on the slides. Okay, so stress is harmful, right? And let's see, 31% uh, of you said um, that it was quite harmful, and 62% uh, said you thought it was very harmful. So the majority of you did think it was harmful, and you were right, uh, because unmanaged stress, so that's stress that goes on for you know, chronically for weeks or months or even years, will cause the chronic release of two hormones, which we call the fight or flight hormones. Um, these are adrenaline and cortisol. And I call adrenaline and cortisol Mother Nature's way to fight a stressful event. So for example, if you're standing on the side of the road and a car almost hits you and you have that sudden burst of energy to jump out of the way and your heart's beating fast and you have that fast dump of sugar in your bloodstream that gives you that energy to, to fight that stressful event, that's the fight or flight hormones, adrenaline and cortisol doing their job. But for a person with diabetes, if you're in fight or flight for weeks or months, adrenaline and cortisol can cause um, an unhealthy increase in your blood sugar. So let's take a look at some of those harmful effects of adrenaline and cortisol when they're released on a chronic uh, level. They can increase your blood sugar and blood pressure, and they can cause your blood vessels to become inflamed. And this will increase your risk for you know, those major problems, the heart attacks and strokes. It can decrease your immunity, and you can have stomach aches, poor, poor sleep headaches, all kinds of problems, and just sort of a general burnout. So those are the, the not good things about stress. But um, some of you did answer that you thought stress could be good. I'm just looking at those numbers then. We had. Um, about 6% of you felt that stress was either not harmful or, at all or not very harmful. And actually, you were right as well. So stress is kind of interesting um, because some stress is actually a good thing. So when you have a release of um, adrenaline and cortisol on the short term, these are what we call the good stress hormones. And it what help, it's what helps get you up in the morning. It motivates you and moves you to get things done and basically makes life interesting. And so you know, ask yourself, did you feel a bit stressed getting supper made, finding the time to connect to this webinar? If you did, it was probably the stress hormones that got you here. So let's look at some of those good effects of short-term adrenaline and cortisol. Uh, faster breathing, which gives you more oxygen. Cortisol actually improves our memory, and it reduces sensitivity to pain. So it helps release uh, a compound called endorphins. And you may have heard of these. These are the things that runners get when they're running, and it gives them a kind of a good, happy feeling. And I kind of call it Mother Nature's um, morphine, because it's, it's a natural compound in our body, but it helps control pain. So that's a really good thing about cortisol. And as we talked about earlier, they do give you that fast-acting sugar, which enters your bloodstream. But this sometimes can be good also to give you that energy you need in the short term. So some other uh, good effects um, of short-term adrenaline and cortisol is, as we talked earlier, these effects motivate you and give you energy to get things done. Uh, these hormones help you stay alert and focused and act on your decisions. And stress hormones help you deal with crises. And one of the early proponents that stress could actually be our friend was Dr. Peter Hansen. And he wrote a book in 1987 called The Joy of Stress. And Dr. Hansen was an emergency room doctor in Vancouver. And he had noticed that most of his patients blamed stress for their medical and their personal problems. But he became inspired by a few of his patients who had the same stress levels but with different outcomes. So these few people, they still had the demanding stresses at work or tragic stresses in their own personal lives, but they made a different set of choices than their peers. And they seemed to be able to prosper at work and live still a long and healthy life. And so it was from these patients that he realized that good health does not necessarily depend on the amount of stress, but rather on how you manage that stress or the quality of choices you make and, and, and what your outlook is. And in part, some of the benefits that Dr. Hansen observed, 
may be due in part to another hormone that we haven't talked about, and this is a hormone called oxytocin. So oxytocin is the good stress hormone, <laughs> and it actually counteracts the effects of the fight and flight hormones of the adrenaline and the cortisol. And it, has, it also has sort of a little name we call it. We call it the tend and befriend hormone. And you can see from this picture that uh, the woman is uh, tending or caring for um, her child. And um, this hormone gives us the, um, it, it makes us want to tend to look after others and also to be social or to befriend others. So oxytocin is often called the bonding hormone uh, with mothers and fathers with their new babies. It's also called the cuddle hormone, and it's called the big O hormone, and that is O for orgasm. And indeed, oxytocin is a female and a male hormone as well. And it makes us feel good and social and cuddly and want to bond. So a few more things about this great um, hormone, oxytocin. It protects your nervous system from shutting down during fear or stress. So for example, um, for those of you on the line who've had a child or have had a baby, you know that childbirth can be uh, a painful experience. And we believe that the oxytocin actually protects mothers um, afterwards because studies have shown that after childbirth, um, women don't experience the same type of tra traumatic stress syndrome as they would after other types of pain. And it's believed that the oxytocin protects that. So in general, it helps uh, you manage fear, anxiety, and pain, and it helps you respond and defend yourself sort of against the unknown. And one of the things that's uh, interesting about oxytocin also is that it helps to relax your blood vessels. And you may remember that um, adrenaline tightened or constricted your blood vessels, and that was one of the sort of side effects uh, with blood pressure, whereas oxytocin does the opposite. And it encourages oxytocin, the hormone encourages us to care and seek social support and contact um, in difficult times. So you might be wondering, um, this thing is so good. How do I get some more of it? You know, can I inject it into myself? Um, and unfortunately, um, you can't. But there is one way you can get more. And that is the more you give, the more you get. So because it's a caring hormone, um, literally, the more caring you do, the more you get. And we're going to get into that in just a moment. And some people are so um, enamored with oxytocin that they actually have it tattooed on their shoulder. So this is a tattoo of the chemical structure of oxytocin that someone, I'm not sure if that's a man or a woman, had uh, tattooed on their shoulder. So I want to tell you about a study. Some of you may know about the Blue Zones. And this is work that was done by Dan Butner and his colleagues. And if you want to read more about it, you can go to his website, bluezones.com. And what they did is they had a really fun job. They got to travel all over the world and look for people who lived long and healthy lives. So they looked for people who were in their 80s and 90s and, and 100s, so the centen centenarians. And then they looked for those people who lived long but were also healthy. And they looked for common lifestyle habits of these long-lived people. And they identified nine traits that were common amongst most of the populations. I'm going to tell you about those nine traits. So the first trait was that these people who lived long and were healthy moved naturally. So they didn't really go to the gym and pump iron or run marathons, but they lived in an environment that gave, them the, that gave them the opportunity to move without really thinking about it. So they had their own gardens. They did things by hand in their home and outdoors. They went for walks. Um, so they moved naturally. The second thing that they had was they had a purpose in life. And you may be surprised to know, but there's two risky times in life when you might die quite suddenly. One is at childbirth, and the other is when you retire. And that's because many people who retire lose their sense of purpose in life. So if you're recently retiring, or you're going to be retiring, or you've just retired, and you haven't found a purpose yet, then start looking. There's many reasons to live. And knowing why you wake up in the morning is actually worth seven years of extra life expectancy. So the studies have shown you'll live seven years longer if you have a purpose in life. 
So find a purpose in life that's for you. Um, you know, it may be wanting to spend as much time as you can with your grandchildren. It might be wanting to plant your garden and watch it grow. It might be wanting to get out on the golf course as much as you can, or loving to cook and clean your home, or even wanting to wake up and buy a lottery ticket every week. Whatever your reason, um, find that purpose. The next thing they found for the people in the blue zone um, populations was they had positive ways to manage stress. So um, what they did was every day they did something that was built into their life that helped them manage stress. And I think this is a huge thing in today, today's world because we're so busy with technology and you know, everything coming at us and phones and cell phones that we don't have those quiet moments to reflect and just have a nap or have a cup of tea, or sit quietly. And the people in the Blue Zones had those quiet moments. The fourth thing about the Blue Zone traits is they stopped eating. Um, they stopped eating before they got full. And I call it the eat less rule. So you might be wondering, well, how do you do this? Right? Because there's so much food, and it's so good. Well, for starters, it's a good idea to eat at home, because we know that people who eat at home eat less than people who eat at drive-in you know, take out restaurants and, and go to restaurants a lot. We just eat more when we go to restaurants. So eat at home, eat around a table, eat with your family or friends if you have family or friends with you, uh, drink water with your meal so that you slow yourself down, eat lots of vegetables which are good for you but they slow you down, and take your time eating and become mindful of what and how much you are eating. The next blue zone trait was uh, they chose lots of plants, so the fruits and vegetables and grains um, in their diet, and they ate less meat. Six was moderate alcohol, or what they called wine at five in the study. And the trick is to drink one or two glasses per day with friends and or with food. And no, you can't save it up all on the weekend and have seven drinks on Saturday and get the same benefit. However, I'd like to point out that in regards to the fifth and the sixth trait, so the, uh, the, the five, choose plants and less meat, and moderate alcohol, that n not all the groups um, fit in, in, into these traits. So the Seventh-day Adventists were one of the long-lived groups, and they're vegetarian, so they didn't eat meat at all, and they also do not drink alcohol at all. So it's not an, an essential thing, but it is you know, one of the things that they identified um, in the Blue Zone studies. And of course, every recommendation needs to be individualized. Seven, faith. 98% um, of the centenarians, so that's the people who lived over 100, who had been interviewed, belonged to some kind of faith-based community. And it may be that this allowed them for a short time to give up their worries, or maybe the social benefits of the faith community of, of going to a place with other people. Eight was uh, they put loved ones first, so they tended to have uh, aging parents and grandparents nearby or in their own home. They spent time with their children. They had maybe a life partner or a long-term friend. One of the examples was the Okinawans from Japan, which is a group of people from Japan. Um, who were in the Blue Zone study. And early in their life, they created groups of five friends that they committed to for life. Um, you know, really, really cool stuff. <laughs> uh, then the ninth, the last trait was healthy families and friends. And we know this from other research that when we tend to be around other people who are healthier, we're healthier. And if we tend to be around people who are less healthy, um, we become less healthy as well. So if you look at those nine blue zone traits, and I, I think, what is it about those traits that is sort of a common thing amongst all of them? And the one thing that I find that's common amongst all of them is that they all have some sort of connectivity, or there's, there's something, and, and I call it the, the oxytocin that's working here. So it's the connection. So if we look at the move naturally, people are um, moving um, often with other people, walking with other people. Having a purpose in life is often around other people. Uh, managing stress, you might do that on your own or you might be with other uh, people as, as part of that stress management. And we talked about stopping uh, eating before you get full and choosing plants and less meat. That's about being around together around the table. That's being be connected. 
the moderate alcohol was, was not related to people who are drinking on their own. It was related to a connection, having faith had a connection, and then, of course, eight and nine, loved ones first and healthy families, all related to connection. So this is the oxytocin um, at work here. So I want to now tell you about some two really exciting recent studies that have been done. The first one has been done by Dr. Abiola Keller and uh, her colleagues. And the study was called, Does the Perception That Stress Affect Health Matter? It's a funny title, but what she's saying is, what we think about stress, does that actually affect our health? And she's from the University of Wisconsin School of Medicine and Public Health, and her study is reported in the Journal of Health Psychology um, in 2012. And I'm going to tell you about that one in a moment, but I just want to tell you about the next one, uh, which is done by Dr. Poulin. And it's called Giving to Others and this Association be Between Stress and Mortality. So mortality is dying. So he was measuring how does um, whether we give to others affect um, stress and, and how soon we might die. And his work uh, was published in the American Journal of Public Health just last year. So these are both really uh, recent studies. So let's take a look first at the Keller study. So this was the one that was to do with um, how we think about stress. So what they did was they had 30,000 adults. It was a big study. They were um, 17 years and older, split pretty well between men and women. And they studied the people for nine years. They asked them two questions. How much stress have you had in the last year? And do you believe that stress is harmful for your health? And you're going to be recognizing both of those questions because I asked you those questions um, at the beginning. So how much stress have you had in the last year? And do you believe that stress is harmful for your health? And then what they did was they tracked deaths over the, last, the next eight years of these 30,000 people. And they found that there was a 43% increase in death for those who reported a lot of life stressful events and who also believed that stress was harmful. So if you had a lot of stress in your event, in your life, and many of you, uh, when we did that survey, did rate your stress quite high, and you also believed that stress was harmful, then you were 43% more likely, those people were 43% more likely to die. But what's really interesting about this, this work is that for those who believed that stress was not harmful to their health, were not more likely to die statistically. So if you did not believe that stress was harmful, um, then in fact, the stressful event, you were able to overcome that stressful event. So this is really very, um, very interesting um, statistics because it's telling us that our, our outlook on life, whether we're seeing that glass half full or half empty, can really make quite a difference. Let's look at one other study, the Poulin study. So this was done with 1,000 adults in the United States, um, age 34 to 93, and they studied them for five years. And in this study, they asked them two questions. The first one was the, was the same, how much stress have you had in the last year? And the second one was, how much time have you spent helping friends, neighbors, and people in your community? And again, you'll recognize that question as the one that you answered on the poll at the beginning. And then what they did was they tracked the deaths over the next five years. And they found that there was a 30% increase in deaths based on life stressful events. So what they found was that people who had, had a lot of stress in their life uh, were more likely to uh, pass away. However, I'm just waiting. This uh, isn't clicking on. I'll just give it a second. Okay. So they found there was a 30% increase in death based on life stressful events. But for those who had high levels of caring, so who had spent a lot of time helping friends, neighbors, and family, were no more at risk of death based on their life stressful events. So what we're saying here is that people who were doing a lot of caring and were probably ha having a lot of oxytocin in their system were protected from the stress that they were experiencing in their life. So again, pretty, um, pretty interesting information coming out of the Keller and the Poulin studies. 
And what they're showing is that the harmful effects of stress are not inevitable. And that when we connect with others during times of stress, we can better manage stress. And also how you view your stress and how we trust ourselves to manage stress. So we have to trust ourselves that, that we can get through something, that that can actually transform the negative effects of stress. Another way to say this is if we believe stress is positive, we can then rise to the challenge of managing it. Interesting, very interesting stuff. Now I wanted to uh, switch, switch for a moment and I want to talk about what are some of the emotions that people feel when they're stressed and what can we do to manage that stress better. And I'm going to tell you about some findings from a presentation on stress um, that I did with a co-presenter, Janice Medill, a social worker. And we presented at the National Aboriginal Diabetes Association Conference last year. And if anybody's interested, um, you can read the um, uh, report that we wrote up on it. It's in um, the nada.ca website under resources. It was the February 2014. And what we did, we had about 100 people, 100 diabetes, diabetes educators primarily at this conference. And we asked them to identify feelings that mean stress. So we, there was 100 people and we broke them up into about nine groups. And they identified a lot of different words. And then we categorized it into these 10 words that you see on the screen. So these were the most common words that they used to describe stress. And as you look at this list, you probably are able to identify things that you feel when you're stressed. You may also feel something very different that we don't have on this, uh, that I don't have on this slide that the participants didn't identify because, of course, stress comes in many forms. But you'll see overwhelmed, helpless. Uh, we're up at the top two. Uh, emotionally hurt, physically sick, afraid and angry, confused, depressed, sad, um, indifferent. Those were... Um, you know, common feelings related to stress. So after the participants at this conference identified those 10 feelings, we then asked them to determine how would they suggest that people manage those stressful situations. And again, we categorized them into groups. And they identified three ways, self-help, which I'm going to talk to you about in just a moment, planning work, and socializing and helping others. And I think because these were diabetes educators, that's probably why they had planning work as one of the, one of the categories. Um, so under um, self-help, they identified uh, meditation, uh, taking a bath, aromatherapy, which is using scents such as scented candles, music, exercise, dance, yoga, walking, pets, eating well, smudging, um, which is an Aboriginal spiritual ceremony that involves the burning of herbs such as sage or sweetgrass, pray, laugh, and rest. Under the next category, which was planning work, they had delegate, say no, uh, develop routines, prioritize schedule, communicate well, hire help if you're able, organize, and time management. Under socialize and help others, they had family events, classes, learning, spending time with trusted friends. So they had lots of uh, great ideas that they came up with. And actually, these are fairly similar to ideas that I've identified as well in my book. And this is my second book, uh, Canada's Complete Diabetes Guide for Type 2 Diabetes. And I have seven chapters in the book. And the sixth chapter is called Staying Upbeat. And I've identified sort of 16 groupings of stress behaviors that work. And as we go through this, I want you to, you know, if you have a pen in front of you, if there's an idea that you think, oh, that's something that maybe I could do over the next month to help deal with my stress, jot it down. Because I want you to walk away today with um, a couple of ideas that might work for you to help uh, manage your stress. So we're going to go to the uh, first stress behavior which is slow down a bit. And I talked earlier about how we have you know, so much going on in our lives. And you know, sometimes we just need to slow down and literally smell the roses. Ask yourself, what do you feel if you're feeling overwhelmed? Because that is one of the, you know, the big feelings that people feel with stress. Ask yourself, what do I need to do right away to deal with this? What small thing can I do? We talked about that planning work. One step at a time, trying to reach small, reachable goals. 
sometimes that's easier said than done to slow down. Thinking in healthy ways. Some people find journaling helps, uh, writing down what your feelings are, and then looking at those feelings. And if they're negative thoughts or feelings, um, trying to replace them with positive thoughts. Because we know by that research by Keller and colleagues that thoughts are powerful. If you're journaling and the journaling is only negative journaling, it may not be helping you. You want to try and replace some of those negative thoughts. Um, and this is a quote, and it's a quote for myself because it's from my own book, but the world is simpler when we sometimes, than we sometimes imagine. And sometimes you get less overwhelmed if you don't overthink. And um, you know, we all need to do this. And I think that's because someone told me that, that I put it in my book, because I need to remind myself over and over, uh, don't overthink things. You know, sometimes it's not as complicated as we think it is. So thinking in healthy ways, again, capturing the power of our thoughts in a very positive way helps uh, manage stress. Talk it out. Spend time with trusted friends. Um, it's good to share our troubles and our pain. There are times you just need to be alone. We don't always need to be talking with someone else. Um, but there's also times when talking with someone else uh, is good. And of course, some of us, and there may be some of you on the line uh, today, that don't have that trusted friend or family member that you can um, you know, share your troubles and your pain with. And so then I do encourage you to uh, seek out help from others, um, go to your doctor or health worker, um, just to talk sometimes, um, or maybe for pain management. And I'm not suggesting you go to your doctor and you know, spend an hour in telling all your troubles or the health worker, but you know, if there's something you need to talk about, um, there's nothing wrong with doing that. And, and if there's any health professionals on the line tonight, I have a note to health professionals, and that's don't ever feel your time has been wasted because all you did was listen. Being that listening ear can benefit the person with diabetes as much as education about diabetes, or in some cases, as much as medication. So uh, the power of, of talk and listening um, can be strong. It's OK to let it out sometimes. Uh, just going out in the forest and the woods and letting out a scream where no one else can hear you, it can feel pretty good. Um, crying can be good. Uh, we would not have tear ducts if we weren't meant to cry. Um, but I also want to say that if you're crying and you can't stop crying, um, that's a different situation and, and um, it's the time to seek uh, perhaps medical attention as well. Keep learning. We've got to keep that brain exercised um, at all times, but particularly as we get older. Just take small bites of learning. Um, you don't necessarily have to learn how to do become a potter. You can just learn something small. Group classes, if you even learn one little thing from that class, that's good. Um, learn a new skill. It doesn't have to be a difficult skill, but something new. Volunteering and helping others. We know from the pooling study what a difference that made in terms of people being able to, to manage their stress. Have fun. Ah, laughter helps us accept our limitations and still get on with taking care of ourselves the best we can. Um, you know, sometimes, yeah, we need to take that break or vacation. And, and uh, sometimes I say we need to keep those happy, good moments close to us. You know, tuck them away somewhere, fold them up like a napkin, and when you need that happy thought, take it out and open it up. Uh, write down happy things. Bring out the, mem the photographs that have happy memories um, with them. And um, I want to tell you about this uh, smiling. Smiling makes you feel positive. And, and uh, here's a picture of a, um, of a woman smiling. And I want to tell you about this picture. Um, I was born and brought up in Nairobi, uh, which is in Kenya, in East Africa. And this beautiful young Maasai woman from Kenya has such an amazing smile on her face. And I have seen this smile all across Africa. And that is in spite of often crushing poverty and difficult life circumstances. And what's really interesting is that studies show that people who have a lot of adversity in their life tend to be more resilient. And resilient means that if you've been through hard times, you can actually cope with current stress better. And I'm sure there's some of you on the line that are nodding. And those who have not experienced hardship actually have sometimes a harder, more difficult time coping with stress. So it's sort of like looking at the glass half full. If you believe you can get through something, you can. 
But if you see it as hopeless and empty, um, it's a lot harder to be resilient. Believe in something, find hope. Now, we saw in the blue zones that uh, people who had faith tended to, uh, were, were one of those groups that were, or one of those traits that was identified. But I personally believe that the most important thing to believe in is yourself. Um, you may have, have had some big obstacles to overcome. Uh, good for you. We need to believe in ourselves to be able to find that hope. And in fact, you may not have any religious beliefs, but you might have equally strong beliefs that are calming and give hope. And that might be a belief in, in art or a belief in nature, or it could be some kind of a shared interest. Uh, you might be part of a group that's almost um, has those, those benefits of a faith type of group. It might be an Alcoholic Anonymous, or it might be an internet health group. Uh, from around the world where everyone has the same interest, or around BC, you might be part of a, I don't know, a Cocker Spaniel dog group, or a knitting group, or a hockey card collector group. But it's something that, um, that you believe in, and, uh, and that gives you, um, gives you that strength. The path of healing. Um, many people, including some of you uh, tonight on the line, uh, may have had terribly hurtful things um, happen in your life. And the path of healing is really be, uh, different for everybody, and, and there's no right way or wrong way uh, to find that path, and sometimes it's a very difficult path. But people who've been on that path often say that you know keeping busy is one of the things that helps them. Um, so that is, that can be part of the path of healing. Finding meaningful work and volunteering, again, getting some oxytocin flowing choosing something that you'll enjoy and that makes use of your special qualities and you know looking for your own path. Make your home your nest. Um, you may think this is kind of a, a strange stress reduction thing that I've got in here, but when you think about it, we spend a lot of time in our home. And as we get older, we spend more time in our home. So take a look at that picture on the right-hand side and now imagine a little vase on the table with a bright yellow flower in it, what difference that might make. Or a new paint color on the wall behind, maybe a light, very pale green, a relaxing color. Or replace a couple of those pillows with uh, cheery colored pillows. Or some aromatherapy, it's Christmas, so put a, um, a candle, a scented candle, maybe cranberry or something on the table. Um, those things can start making a difference um, in our life. Now, the pictures at the bottom, um, Part of making your home your nest is also reducing clutter. Did you know that studies show that reducing clutter in your home can help a person lose weight? So clutter, which is what we see on the before picture, causes stress and a feeling of failure, and this can lead to overeating. And also, you've got a lot of food showing on that left-hand uh, left picture, which is in your face all the time. And if your fridge, your freezer, your counter, your cupboards, your kitchen table you're supposed to eat are all cluttered with high calorie foods, you're going to be tempted. So I like to call it the out of sight, out of mind. Put that food out of sight, out of mind. Keep your dining area clean and tidy and you'll start wanting to enjoy eating at home more. Feed your brain some good food. And that picture in the middle, of course, is showing a family um, eating together at the table. We know that your brain controls mood, and you need the proper uh, nutrients for that, such as magnesium, B vitamins, omega-3 fats, tryptophan um, also helps uh, relax. And you may need to get rid of your weight scale. That's just sort of a little side thought there. The weight scale could be helping you or it could be not helping you. That's a question you need to answer yourself. So walk, dance, exercise. That was identified by the participants at the conference I talked about. Literally walk away from the stress. Um, even a large body can be fit and strong. Um, exercise helps you pump happy hormones. That's those endorphins we talked about earlier. Um, that relax you and that reduce inflammation. And while you're out walking, um, I hope you can enjoy some of that nature. They've actually um, identified 
a problem in children, and they call it Nature Deficit Disorder, or NDD. They always have these initials for everything. NDD, Nature Deficit Disorder, and that's because children no longer know what nature is in many cases. They're you know, sitting in front of a screen um, or in front of a, um, electronics, and they just simply have lost touch with nature, and they're getting sick because of it. Because of it. So enjoying nature, we have an, a, a natural inbuilt need for nature. And if you can get exercise at the same time, all the better. Sunlight, you will also hopefully get sunlight while you're out enjoying nature and getting your, your walk. And that's going to stimulate your senses and lift your spirits. And we know the winter blues, which is uh, you know, a form of depression or sadness, can be more common in people who live in northern climates or shift workers who aren't getting sunlight uh, or who may not be getting the vitamin D. So being outdoor gives you the vitamin D, which may also help lift your mood. Look your best. Now, I'm not saying here you should be wearing fancy cowboy boots or high heel shoes, but I'm saying one of the most important things you can do to look your best is to put, that, to put the smile on. Um, there are times in your life you just don't want to smile, and that's okay. We've all got those times. But if you can put the smile on, it's hard to be grumpy when you've got the smile on, and it is a really important thing you can wear. Um, we need to feel good in what we're wearing. Um, that can affect how we feel, and I have some look good clothing tips in my book. But, you know, basically um, having clothes that you feel comfortable in. Music is a really important stress reduction strategy for people. Um, it affects our mood, and it's so important that it's recognized as a healing therapy. So for example, in long-term care institutions, when they bring music um, into the homes, uh, people's mood starts improving and their health starts improving. Um, you could do drumming classes. You could do Aboriginal drumming, or you could do Japanese drumming. Literally, drum your stress out. It's a great way to pound it out. Singing and being sung to, even if you're not a great singer, helps with stress. Uh, if you don't know how to play an instrument, uh, if you do, that's great. Uh, playing a guitar or the piano or a saxophone. And if you're not musical, you can still put on an iPod or your headphones um, and listen to your favorite music that's upbeat and fun. And I just have a little uh, note on the bottom right of that one, which talked about art therapy. Um, which has the same kind of benefits as uh, music therapy. So for people who are doing art, um, that also can be very healing. Even if you're not a great artist, just the act of, of doing art can be healing. So we couldn't talk about stress reduction today without pets. And I'm sure some of you listening have um, a wonderful pet that you love. And we know that pets can be a very important form of touch. And they need our attention as much as we need theirs. And often, of course, we think about dogs or cats, but your pet might be a rabbit or it might even be a chicken. And some of you uh, may have read the amazing novel called The Power of One by Bryce Courtney. And it takes place in South Africa. And the young boy in the story is called PK. And he has a pet chicken. And that pet chicken gets him through a lot of very tough times. So um, pets can be very important for, for many of us. And other kinds of touch. Um, of course, we're talking about appropriate and invited touch. And it can come in many forms. It does have the power to relax and to improve health. And when we have touch, we actually get a release of that cuddle hormone, the oxytocin. And that's by holding hands, by dancing, having a hand manicure, a foot or back massage, even a washer cut. That's why it's so nice to go to the barber or to go to the um, um, hairdresser and have your hair cut. You can take a little dab of hand cream and put it on your hands and take one song, put, put the radio on and play one song, um, or just you know, take a minute and massage your hands. It's a really easy way to help relax yourself. And if you have dry hands because of the diabetes, you can also do the same for your feet. If you have dry feet, it's a great way to uh, relax yourself. Just remember not to put the cream between your toes. And a relaxing bath or shower is probably the thing that I use when I come home if I feel stressed from a, from a day of work. Um, I get in the shower and feel the touch of that warm water, and it's a um, really uh, wonderful way to, to help relax. 
And it's good to let go of tensions with more intimate touch. And when sex, sex is safe and enjoyable, uh, go for it, whether you're with a partner or flying solo. Ah, sleep. Um, well, we say get seven to eight hours. That's hard for some of us. Some need more and some need a little bit less, but that's kind of the average. Uh, we could probably talk a uh, whole two hours just on, on sleep, but here's a couple of thoughts. Have a regular bedtime routine. Limit stimulant drugs before, you know, an hour or two before you go to bed. That includes coffee or, or strong tea. Limit excessive night snacking. Limit long daytime naps. Um, have a good mattress that's comfortable, a room temperature that's cool, and darkening. There's a lot of information about the effect of too much light and that we really need to put darkening shades on uh, to help with our sleep. And there are times when someone is not sleeping well that they may need to uh, talk to their doctor or that you may need to talk to your doctor. So I want to end with um, just a couple of easy type of stress relaxing things. The first one that can be done in less than one minute. And you can actually try this right now. Just take a deep breath um, in, your, in through your nose, and then gently breathe out through your mouth. So just a, inhale through your nose and breathe out through your mouth. It's something you can do during the day whenever you're feeling stressed. Just do it once or twice. You don't have to do it a whole bunch of times and hyperventilate. Just do it once or twice. It gives you an immediate oxygen boost and helps relax you, and it takes less than a minute. Here's a short exercise that you can also do that takes maybe one minute, maybe three, and you can actually do this as you're sitting in your chair. Or if you're standing, just tip your head down to your shoulder to just stretch that area at the side of your neck where a lot of tension can build up. And now turn your head to the other side and just stretch the other side. Now I want you just to shrug your shoulders and just say, I don't know. Just, I don't know. Just give a good shrug of those shoulders. And if you want, you can just rotate those shoulders, giving them a front rotation and ro rotating them to the, to the front, so backwards and forwards. And what happens when we're feeling stressed is a lot of that stress builds up in our muscles, and they get tight. So just a simple exercise like this is an easy way to help relieve some of that tension. This is focus relaxation. It takes a little bit longer, about 10 minutes. I have an example in my book where I lead you through the steps you can take. But for those of you that don't have my book, go to youtube.com, fabulous place to go, and then put in the search engine 15-minute guided meditation. And hundreds of guided meditations will come up. And either you can choose either a man's voice or a woman's voice and you can watch a video it's usually of nature or the ocean waves gently flowing and the person will lead you through um, a 15-minute guided meditation you can do it with your eyes closed or you can watch the picture on the screen and it's just a really way easy way to relax and then the question i have there is how much time do you really do you spend really relaxing and you're fully relaxing, like this focus relaxation. And if you spent only 1% of your day focusing on relaxing, that's just 10 minutes. 1% is just 10 minutes. So if when I put this slide up at first, you thought to yourself, oh, I'd never do that, never spend 10 minutes doing that. It's a waste of my time. Well, consider this. If you did that, and that's 1% of your day, studies have shown that 10 minutes a day of focus relaxation can make a significant improvement in your blood sugar, your blood pressure, and your overall health. So it might be something you want to consider doing, especially for those of you, you know, who rated yourself up in the four and five as having a lot or a very lot of, of stress. And there was 10, let's see, 10% of you rated yourself as medium stress, 53% as high, and 33% as very high. So maybe it's worth something. Maybe it's worth considering. Maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, but maybe sometime in the next month or so. Tai Chi or yoga, it takes a little bit longer, 15 minutes or more, but these slow controlled movements and poses can focus your attention away from outside distractions. And there is yoga and Tai Chi specifically for seniors with lower flexibility. So not only do you get the stress relaxation benefit, but you also get get great strengthening 
and relaxing uh, option as well. So we're almost at the end here, and what I would like you to do is I want you to think what could you do to move yourself down one level or one point within the next month. So if you rated your stress at five, what could you do to bring yourself to a four or four and a half? Or if you were a three, what could you do to get to a two and a half? Um, and again, you know, think about some of these, and you may have some of your own ideas or things that you've heard from other people that have worked for stress relaxation. Think about trying to implement um, one of them over the next month um, to try and uh, reduce your stress. And perhaps after that point, uh, you might feel like this fellow on my next slide when the slide comes up. And it's a pooch, and he's pretty darn relaxed there. And uh, maybe we don't want to be quite that relaxed, because that means we wouldn't have any adrenaline and cortisol working through our system. But um, it is nice to be relaxed, um, to learn how to relax periodically. So that is the end of my uh, um, presentation. And now I'm uh, um, interested and in waiting to hear your questions. And I'll try my best to, to answer any of your questions that you have. Thanks, Karen. The presentation was so good. And even I got a lot of tips and um, um, really great recommendations from you. So um, just a reminder for people, if you want to ask questions, the Q&A pod is on your bottom left-hand corner. Just type in your questions there, and I'll be able to see it on my end. And I'll be able to ask um, Karen. So, um, Maybe I'll give you a couple of minutes for that. And um, if you have a couple of minutes, um, just click on the link here. It's a post survey. And uh, it's a chance for you to reflect on what you've learned and to tell us what um, suggestions you have. And we do read all of these. And we would love to make the webinars even better for you. So Karen, I have a couple of questions here to start off with. The first one is, does vitamin D help with um, people who are living with diabetes and have depression? Well, yes. Um, in fact, in one of those slides that we looked at, where we looked at the benefit of sunlight and vitamin D, so we do know that uh, vitamin D does have a role in terms of, um, of stress management. So yes, uh, definitely. And the best way to get vitamin D is always to get it um, through sunlight, if you can, because I think there's other benefits in just sort of being outdoors so that we're not indoors all the time. And you can take vitamin D supplements. Um, but it's, it's best if you can get some from the sunlight. And it's hard in, you know, where we live in Canada because we don't have great sunlight all year round. I live in Kelowna, and it can be pretty cloudy a lot of that time, but you do get some sunlight through the sun. And you also build some sun, uh, some vitamin D during the summer when we get a little bit of sunlight. Um, and also you get vitamin D from some of the foods that you eat. So milk is one of the best sources of vitamin D. Uh, because milk has vitamin D added. And for those of you that maybe don't drink milk, but you drink another type of um, milk-like product, often vitamin D is added into that as well. So that's also another source. And uh, we also get some vitamin D from fish, so fatty fishes, if you like things like salmon or sardine, uh, liver, eggs. Those are all great sources of vitamin D as well. Um, so yes, vitamin D is important in terms of mood. Um, I, I don't know that I would say specifically for depression, um, because depression is a, a little bit different. I mean, depression, we still want to apply many of these stress management tools that we've talked about. Um, but there may be other strategies further that are needed to manage the, uh, depression. And that may include medication in some cases, but, but not in all cases. Thanks, Karen. And just a reminder for everybody, um, instead of typing your questions into the chat box, it's just easier for me to keep track of the questions if you type it on your bottom left-hand corner and it says Q&A. So that's our Q&A box. Um, it just helps me to keep track of some of these questions here. So the next one for you, Karen, is, is there a difference between physical stress and psychological stress? So physical stress and psychological stress are really one and the same thing because we're all one body. So our brain is attached to the physical part of our body. So if we're feeling psychological stress, which would be you know, how we're thinking in our brain, it is going to affect us physically as well. So 
So we're going to have those physical symptoms, whether it's that you know, stomach ache or diarrhea or those physical kinds of things. Those are the physical symptoms of stress. And the, the mental or psychological symptoms are um, like the feeling overwhelmed. Um, so they're different, but they're interconnected. So one can the psychological stress is what's going to cause the physical stress symptoms or in a more severe case where you're getting inflammation inside your blood. You know, we know that people who have a lot of stress and don't manage it well and maybe who have the wrong attitude towards stress or not, not the wrong one, but they maybe believe stress is very harmful, uh, may in fact have more physical symptoms than someone else. Perfect. Thanks for explaining that, Karen. Um, so here we have somebody who just wants you to repeat what's three fundamentals again. It's self-help, plan work, and what was the last one? Uh, self-help. <laughs> no, you got me. I've been talking too much. Self-help, plan work, and let me flip back here, and we'll get the third one here from the presentation. and socialize, help other. I knew it was something, I just didn't know what the term was. So self-help was one, plan work, and socialize and help others. Those were the three fundamental ways that were identified by the participants. Perfect, thanks for repeating that. Um, so the next one for you is, what is your advice regarding type ones who constantly worry about complications? Sometimes deep breathing doesn't help to get those thoughts out of that person's mind. Yeah, and you know, as a, as a diabetes educator myself, this is something, um, since I've looked at this new research, that I've really had to look at myself is um, how we work with patients, uh, whether you have type 1 diabetes, uh, such as the person asking the question, or type 2 diabetes. And so as an educator, if we are telling people all the time that stress is harmful, stress is harmful, and you're thinking that all the time, um, it, it creates the, those feelings that you're having. And, and sorry, the question was that you have continued stress because you're thinking about it. Was that what it was, the question? Yeah, I think it's um, because a person is constantly worrying about complications. Constantly worrying, yeah. So. Um, we, it's really hard for us to change our characters. Um, some of us are worriers and some of us are not. But worrying about it really isn't going to make that complication less likely. So I think if you can um, look at these strategies that I've listed and try and find something that will help you relax or take your mind off that worry, you're going to be further ahead. Because I think logically we all know that worrying doesn't, doesn't help, <laughs> although it's hard for us to, to stop that. It's easier said than done. So I would say just take one or two small steps. You're not going to change yourself overnight if you're a worrier, but take one or two steps. And I'm not saying that you know, the complications um, are not significant and aren't something we need to be concerned about. They are but we need to, to do the things that are going to help our blood sugar be best, and that's you know, going for a walk, eating as healthy as we can, and doing things that help manage our stress to, to take care of ourselves. Thanks, Karen. That's really, really helpful. Sorry, the last, the third um, fundamental was social interaction? Uh, socialize and help others. Socialize. Which would be the same as as a, yeah, social interaction. Perfect. And just to let people know, um, our upcoming webinars, um, there is one in March that we're going to talk about, I Want to Be Well, but Some Days is Hard with Crystal Johnson. And the registration is coming up for that one. I just noticed a lot of the questions have to do with that. So please do come back and join us in March. Um, we have another upcoming webinar in January, and it's called Making Your Carbohydrates Count. And um, if you want to register for that right now, it's um, you can click on that link um, on the PowerPoint. And I've moved the post survey now to your top right right-hand corner, and it'd be great if you could do the post-survey for us. So the next question here is, what, why when stressed do some of us crave sugars and salt? Well, uh, sorry, can you read that again? Sure. Um, why when stressed do some of us crave salt and sugar? Well, why does stress cause some of us to crave salt and sugar? Yeah, that's right. Okay. 
So here we're talking about cravings then, um, which are you know challenging. And uh, when we're feeling stressed, we tend to go to those things that are most comfortable for us. And it's a learned behavior. So for many of us, we have learned or taught ourselves or someone has taught us, we have learned that when we're craving something, we turn to food. Now, in some societies, they learn that when they're feeling stressed, they maybe do meditation. But in our society, we have often learned to um, simply eat. So what we need to do is we need to relearn. And that's not easy. It is possible, though. But that habit of craving food is, has been learned by doing that many, 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 many times. So many, many times we have felt stressed, and many, many times we have turned to food. So again, overnight, you're not going to change that habit. But, but there are certain things that can help you um, start making a change to conquer those cravings. And I use the rule. It's called the three Ds of dealing with cravings. And the first D is to take a deep breath. So that was one of the things we had at the end of the presentation. Take a deep breath. That's the first D. The second D is drink water. Have a large glass of water. And the third D is distract yourself. Go do something else. And if you start practicing those three Ds, because a craving tends to come like a wave. And those of you who have quit smoking know about that, that wave that comes. It, it comes, it builds, it gets very high, and then it starts going down. And so by practicing the three Ds of dealing with cravings, it helps you get over that hump and move on. And you need to establish a new routine that doesn't have to do with eating. And so learning to practice some of these things we've talked about, um, you know, going out for a walk when you're feeling stressed rather than sitting at home and eating. Now, if you're feeling stressed at, in the middle of the night or at midnight, that's, you can't get up and go out for a walk. It's not safe. So you know, maybe that would be a time to click on to one of those 15-minute meditations. And if you did that 30 or 40 or 50 times, eventually that starts becoming the new habit that when you feel stressed, you then reach for that new, that new opportunity instead of always reaching for that um, that stressful, or for the food. Sorry, I could talk about that a bit more, but I hope that answered the question a little bit in the short time we have. Yes, it really does help. Thanks for the three Ds, and I think that's really even good reminder for myself. So the next question we have here is, how important is diminished expectations in positively dealing with stress? How important is diminished expectations? Uh, do you understand that question, Sharon? In positive I think I think they mean um, if you reduce expectations, does that positively help with stress? Will that decrease if your you stress? If you reduce expectations, ah, yes. Um, and I think I sort of alluded to that in my presentation that sometimes um, stress is our own expectations that we have. It's our own expectations that we have of how other people should treat us. It's our own. Um, you know, and so we often create expectations that are unrealistic, and then it creates stress for us. So I think that um, Jerry, I see that Jerry asked the question, that that's a really good point, Jerry, that if we could diminish our expectations just a little, we might not get uh, so stressed. And so again, it comes back to sort of our outlook on life, the glass half full versus the glass half empty, um, you know, and having that more positive outlook. Yes, it will help us deal more positively with our stress. Thanks. And um, the next question is, can a high level of continued stress cause hormone changes which might cause diabetes? Can high levels of stress uh, cause diabetes? Well. Um, Indirectly, yes. So when you're under a lot of stress, and in fact, um, stressful events is one of the, um, the factors that can cause diabetes. So when we look at the risk factors for diabetes, a stressful event is often the cause. So for example, one of life's very stressful events is when a spouse dies or you've had a, 
uh, a marital breakup or financial worries, and any of those major stressful events can, in fact, result in the trigger that causes diabetes. So what's happening in that stressful event is the person is having those chronic levels of adrenaline and cortisol, and that is then um, resulting in an increase in their blood sugar, increase in their blood pressure, and that's the you know stress that's being put on your pancreas, and eventually um, the pancreas starts pooping out a bit, you know, over um, sort of a couple of months, and it can happen actually fairly quickly. We sometimes see a person's lost their spouse and they develop diabetes a month and a half later because the stress has been so intense, and they haven't had any way or they haven't known any way to manage their stress in a positive way. So it just, you know, it just causes this, this crazy release of, of, of adrenaline. Thanks for sharing that, Karen. Um, the next question we have here is, um, is vitamin B12 helpful for people living with diabetes? Well, um, as a general question, vitamin B12 is helpful for everybody. Um, it's, you know, essential. It's an essential vitamin in the making of hemoglobin and sort of healthy red blood cells and, and our nervous system. So um, because of diabetes, um, it's really important to keep the nerves healthy because long, when the blood sugars are high for many years, um, neuropathy or nerve damage can happen. And so having adequate vitamin B12 is really important. Uh, for healthy um, for healthy nerves as well as blood vessels. So yes, um, it's very important because uh, B12 is very predominant in meats. For most people who have a meat-based diet, um, or they're eating eggs or even fish, not quite as high as meat, but you know they are good sources as well. Um, we'll generally have an adequate vitamin B12 level. Where we see vitamin B12 being low. Um, would be for vegetarians. Um, it is possible to get B12 in a vegetarian diet, but you have to know the right foods to eat. Um, so, you know, sometimes people with, uh, uh, who are on a vegetarian diet might be advised to uh, take a vitamin B12 um, uh, supplement. And then there are some people which, you know, for whatever reason, they're just not um, absorbing the vitamin B12 into their system, and it might be identified on a lab test that they're low, and so it would be beneficial to uh, to take some. Thanks for that. Um, for, thanks for answering that general question. And so again, just a reminder for everyone, if you do want to ask a question, you can type it into the Q&A pod, which is on your bottom left-hand corner. And we're just, um, you know, we have probably about five or six more questions. And talking about exercise, we do have a program that's coming up, and it's called the Walk and Talk. It's a 10-week program. It's one hour weekly that begins with an educational talk, about 10-minute talk on self-management. Um, and um, and it's followed by a 15-minute walk. So we're going to be doing it in Victoria, Vancouver, Kelowna, and Prince George. It begins in March 2015. And if you're interested, just uh, email us there at infobc at diabetes.ca for more information. So Karen, our next question is um, about sleep. So this person gets about eight hours of sleep. And then on other days, they will sleep for 12 hours. Now, would this be from? Um, stress or depression, and this person says they do not suffer from SAD. Okay, so SAD would be um, the light disorder that people feel sort of during the, during the winter. Um, I, I, of course, I can't answer this question, whether it's stress or depression, not knowing, uh, Susan, you know, for yourself, what other situation, you know, what, what is in your life. What I can say is that um, most nights you're having a good amount of sleep. Uh, sleep tends to be on what we call a U curve. So what that means is if you're in that sort of, you know, seven to eight hours, that's the great part of the curve to be in. But if you're getting too much sleep, it's not so healthy. And if you're getting not enough sleep, that's not so healthy either. So sometimes when you're curving up into that 12 hours, that's probably, you know, you're probably getting a little bit too much sleep. But it's, it's really hard for me to comment because I don't know what else is going on in your life and why that might be it. Sometimes that you get a little bit, a little bit more, um, more sleep. So on its own, I can't say that that's long. I mean, people have very different um, patterns. But if, it's, if you were always sleeping 12 hours and you're, um, you know, unless you're um, 
uh, quite an elderly person and you know you need that extra sleep um, then I'd probably you know look at what else is happening in your life in terms of exercise and and how your emotions are and how you're feeling um, about other things um, so I guess it has to be assessed on a, on a greater basis I'm sorry I can't um, you know uh, give a kind of a general answer on that except to say that you know generally following in the middle of the curve is a good place to be um, uh, with with stress oh, sorry with sleep <laughs> Thanks, Karen. Um, and this next question, I think um, you can probably answer a bit of it, but we will probably be touching more on it in March with um, Crystal Johnson. But this person asks, um, can you tell them more about diabetes burnout and how to get back on track emotionally? So diabetes burnout is really hard because, and you've all experienced it, it's just that you don't ever get that day when you don't have diabetes. Um, I think... Um, you know, having good supports around is really important. And so earlier on in my presentation, I talked about, um, you know, some of those things that you, people you can reach out to for help. And I think we sometimes we're trying to take everything on ourselves. We're coping with everything. We're coping with diabetes, and we're also coping with a lot of other things around you. And the age that people develop diabetes is also the age that you often have many other things happening in your life. You might have teenagers still at home. You might have um, older parents that you're maybe caring for. You might be sort of in between there. You may have financial responsibilities. There's a lot of things that can be happening that are contributing to the diabetes burnout, so it's not necessarily the diabetes only. Um, you, you can't take the diabetes away, although with good management you can decrease you know, the, the daily symptoms. But maybe you could tackle something else in your life that might make it easier to manage that diabetes. So I guess that would be the question that um, I would want you to ask yourself is, is there something else I could change that would um, make it easier for me to, to manage that diabetes? And then, of course, I think it's okay to give yourself that allowance to, um, I don't know, to say, I don't want to say off your plan, but to give yourself permission and to not feel guilt for now and then taking a bit of a break as long as it's obviously a safe break that you're taking from your diabetes. I'm not talking about not taking your insulin if you're taking insulin. Um, but in your lifestyle, there are, you know, you may just need to take a break now and again from that and not feel guilty that you're taking the break. Um, and you may actually find that by taking a break, your blood sugars may not be that different from some of the other days just because you're a little bit more relaxed. So finding some things that you can work into your life that are fun and, um, and help with that, I think, can help with that burnout. Thanks, Karen. And for the person and for everybody else who's out there, um, do join us in March. Um, um, that will be basically the webinar. Um, I, want, I, I know what to do, but it's hard to do it some days. Mm -hmm. All right, so we're down to our last three questions, and again, so your last chance here to ask some, some questions. If you want to ask questions, um, type into the Q&A um, pod, which is on your bottom left-hand corner. Um, so our next question is, what is the best way to support a young family member who has type 1 diabetes and who's anorexic? Oh, this is a tough question, and I want to say up front that um, uh, while I've worked as a diabetes educator for 30 years, I work primarily I have worked primarily um, with type 2 diabetes, so my specialty is not type 1, um, so this question might be directed, better directed to um, a specialist in type 1 diabetes, but um, I can answer it in a, in a general sense. Um, and, and what I do want to say is that anorexia is more common um, in um, youth with type 1 diabetes compared to the general population. Um, and so, you know, there's a variety of factors that can contribute to that. Um, and uh, a teenager, I don't know if we're talking about a teenager, you know, a young family member, a youth um, can learn that um, simply by, you know, changing the amount of insulin they're taking that they can change their weight. So they have a very easy way to, um, a, a easy and scary way to, to alter their weight. Um, and so the management of anorexia really would be no different than for anyone else, any other young person uh, with anorexia. And we do recommend 
um, you know, um, a team approach to that in terms of um, psychological support as well as, um, you know, medical um, and nutritional support for that child and the family uh, because it's a very challenging time for the family um, as well as as well as the child. So um, beyond that, I, I, I don't feel comfortable to answer that beyond because I think, again, it's a very individualized kind of question. I do encourage you to uh, seek support for that if, if you're not already. And it might be from uh, one of the eating disorder clinics. I'm not sure um, you know, if the person you're thinking of is in your own community. Um, but quite a few of the communities do have um, uh, eating disorder uh, clinics or support. So uh, you know, look that up online and see if there's something locally. Thanks, Karen. That was very helpful. So um, for, for the person who's looking for the Poulin study, um, I'll maybe switch back to that slide after our webinar is done, and you can jot down the notes there. And so for our last question here, are there any homeopathic remedies to help with neuropathy? Sort of a general question. I'm not really sure if you'll be able to answer it. Uh, so neuropathy, I think, is what we're, we're asking about, nerve damage mm -hmm. here. Yeah. Um, so neuropathy is uh, damage to the nerves, which um, can occur for people who've had diabetes um, for a number of years, especially if the blood sugars are, are higher. And so the first thing that we look at for neuropathy um, is we look at getting those blood sugars down because um, you can have some improvement in neuropathy when the blood sugars improve. So um, in terms of homeopathy, I'm not that's a pretty broad topic, but I would say whatever you can do to bring that blood sugar down is, is likely going to help um, slow down or halt or halt the neuropathy, and sometimes it can, you know, even be slight slight improvements. So um, that might be stress management because maybe it's the stress management you need to bring the blood sugars down. Uh, maybe you need um, more exercise or a different type of exercise regime. You may need a change in in how you're eating, um, and um, you know, that's, that's what I look at, you know, having those healthy meals um, that are easy, uh, easy to make, fast and easy to make, that can provide you with the good nutrition, all the nutrients. We talked earlier about vitamin B12 being important for neuropathy. Um, and also you may need a change in your medications to bring those blood sugars down. So sometimes you might be on, on pills and you might need some insulin or some other injected medication added in. Or maybe you, you just need an, a change or an addition of a different type of, of a pill added in. So really looking at that combination of medications, um, you know, exercise, diet, and, and stress management um, are, are going to be your first steps. And I'm not sure if the person was sort of looking specifically at um, sort of herbal treatments. I don't, I'm not sure if that's what the question is. Um, I do have um, a pretty good section on herbal uh, treatments for diabetes, and if you're interested, you know, pop down to a library, your local library, and take a look at that section in my book. Um, you know, there are some herbs which may have some benefits, and there's also some concerns about herbal supplements, particularly when we're talking about interactions. So, um, you know, there are some that have potential benefits there as well. Thanks, Karen. So thanks, everyone, for coming tonight. Um, I know it's kind of getting late. And thank you so much to all of our volunteers who coordinated the session and made it possible. Um, again, so um, we won't be sending out an evaluation tomorrow. The post survey is on your top right-hand corner right now. So if you could just take um, two minutes to fill that out, that's really helpful for us to see whether or not the webinars are um, making a difference in your lives and how we can make it better um, for our communities. So we just wanted to acknowledge our sponsors, Janssen and One Touch, and thank you for their generous support. And again, so the development and delivery of these impactful programs, such as our webinars, is made possible through the generous donations of our um, donors. So if you have enjoyed this webinar and would like to make a donation, please visit our site at www.diabetes.ca, or you can call us at 1-800-BANTING. 
So thank you very much, everybody, for coming. And thank you, Karen, for sharing these wonderful tips. And we hope to see you all back in January, February, and March. Um, we'll have a couple more webinars until the end of June. So thanks, everybody, for being on here. And thanks, Karen. Have a good night, oh, everyone. Thank you very much. Good night, everyone. Good night. Bye.